Oh boy, this is a big one. Orange and blue today, position previews, wide receiver, Cecil Lammy, Andrew Mason, and you've got a collection of talent that has to work its way through. Like we have to see how mm -hmm. this wide receiver room is going to shake out, Mace, because there's several different combinations. Of course, all starting with Cortland Sutton. Yes. There aren't many names you can put in Sharpie on this group, but Cortland Sutton, wide receiver one is still in his hands. Yes. Despite not being around for OTAs, despite getting there for minicamp and being on the side field after doing some individual work and dropping a couple of passes, it's still in his hands to be the wide receiver one. He did put out there that cryptic we'll see when asked by yours truly whether he would consider a holdout into training camp if his contract stalemate persisted. So to me, it's in his hands. If he shows up, he has if he shows up and balls out, and look, if this off this offense with more slants, more short stuff. Cortland Sutton's got the body type to be a slant god if he could figure it out. Mm -hmm. yep. He has the he has the ability to do it. He he can do more than the nine ball, even though that's what he's known for. He can do more than that. He has that ability. Um. So that's why I say it's it's in his hands if he shows up, practices well, gets the timing and cohesion with Bo Nix, Jarrett Stidham, whoever ends up being the quarterback. If he does that, then it's all in his hands. It was interesting hearing him last month, Cease, because when he had that press conference during minicamp, you alluded to it that there were things that he said that didn't sound like him. It right. sounded like agent speak. The next night after minicamp, he chatted with some of us who were on hand at the Coors Field UC Health Healthy Swings event that Cortland is you know the it is ba he's you know basically kind of the primary force behind it getting teammates to come etc and the way he was talking about guys like tim patrick the way he was talking about bo Nix and how much he he enjoyed being around him how he you know looking forward to uh spending time with everybody else at camp stidham or earlier this month It sounded more like Cortland Sutton, you know, truly wanting to be a Bronco. Like he said the things at the press conference of, I want to be here. I want to be in the you know, ring of fame, blah, blah, right. blah. But it almost felt like he was saying them as the spoonful of sugar to help the medicine of, I've been, I haven't been around and I may be holding out and can't go down. The next night he sounded more like he was all in all for one. And it was maybe not coincidentally after that morning, he and Sean Payton had a pretty earnest chat in Sean Payton's office. And here's what Sutton sounded like. I think that we got a, a really good group of guys in there, you know, from the young guys to guys that have been there that are kind of in that middle age, that, that middle age of year three, year four. Um, I think we got a really good group. And, you know, um, I think that the guys are, are, are ready to go out there and play. They had a really good OTAs and getting to watch those guys at minicamp. They had a really good minicamp. Um, I'm excited to, to get Tim back, man. You, you guys know that's my guy. You know, Tim and I have been doing this together pretty much since I got in the league. So to see him healthy, to see him out there running around, see the smile on his face, to see the joy that he has being back playing ball, I mean, it, it just warms my heart. And I'm excited to go out there and make some plays with him because, you know, the dude the dude is really good at football. And I think that people forgot um, how good he is because he hasn't been able to play in two years. So I'm excited to see him go out there and play the, the young guys and, you know, um, the rest of the team. I think we've got a really good team and it's going to be fun to see us. Unpack that because he was also at that at that Q and a session talking about this team, maybe being able to shock the world. Now, you know, courts, you know, an optimist when it comes to the team, but sure. hearing him talk about the young receivers, talk about Tim Patrick wanting to go out there, catch passes with him, be a part of it again. I think with court, he's realizing that, you know, what he knows is what he wants to be around. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it can be the grass is greener on the other side. Is it? I mean, he could he can ask around the NFL, and you know he'll 
probably get a lot of guys who will tell you, hey, man, you may think it's greener somewhere else, but you're wrong. The other thing also is he says that after spending a couple of days with Bonex. Yep. And talking about how mature Bonex is. I'm glad we're starting this with Cortland Sutton because we obviously, you know, we didn't see him out there, but coming out of mini camp, he, he does. He, there's a role. There's a role for him. And watching this offense, see, I mean, there. It might look different. His success equation is probably going to look different going forward in this offense if he's back and he's still playing. But it doesn't mean he can't be effective. He might even be more effective. Yep. Maybe and... that a- the average per catch goes down, but the receptions go up and the yardage goes up. Yep. You studied Um, and he studied Michael Thomas. And I would say this to his agent and I would say this as myself. I would also say it as Cortland. I want a little raise. If I go out and I'm a slant God and I'm Michael Thomas 2.0, I'm getting a big, big raise. raise. So would you rather have the little, Hey, we paid you. And then they, they're not, you have a big year. You know what they're going to do if they've paid you, they're not going to pay you again. If you bet on yourself, and you kick ass double live Gonzo on the wild side, and you have 1,200 yards, 1,400 yards, right? Let's get crazy. Then you're going to get paid. Then you're yes. holding the cards. Yes. Like, and actually, remember, he's got another year left on his deal after this year. So if yep. he goes out there, goes all slant God on you, and gets 1,300 yards, gets a career high in yardage, has the best season of his career. And again, I mean, it's, you know, he hasn't done that yet, so let's just put it right there. But this that this type of offense, those types of routes bring this out in him. Also, for one thing, two things. Number one, slant God is sustainable for a guy into his 30s. Mm-hmm. If you stay healthy. The unfortunate thing for Michael Thomas is his body broke down. But if you have relatively decent health, you don't have to have the huge speed to be a slant guy. You got to run good routes and use your body. And Cortland Sutton can do that. No, oh, by the way, he's got the other tool on his belt, which is, hey, he's got an elite level ability to adjust to the ball in flight. So imagine, you know, Bo Nix, he's under duress. It's a little bit off. It's a little bit behind. Court's still going to make the grab yep. on that slant if you've got him doing slant god routes. Yep. It's it's not hard to close your eyes and envision this for Court. But the thing is, he's got to be there. He's got to be there because if not, with the rest of that room, and I wrote about this last month at DenverSports.com, if he's not there, the rest of that room, the train is just going to keep whistling on down the tracks without you. Because yeah. they've that's another thing. They've got depth. Beyond Cortland, they don't have a proven wide receiver one, but they've got guys who could become that. They've got quality of depth. This is the most, fat, with respect to quarterback, this is the most fascinating position group on the team. Yes, because you have all sorts of different combinations that you can utilize. And you mentioned bailing them out, right? Like bailing out Bo Nix on a bad throw or a tight coverage or whatever. As much as we appreciate Marvin Mims, that's not Mims' game. Yeah, That's not what he does. He's more of a precision guy, which works really well with Sean Payton. So before we go on too much about this, because we got plenty of other guys to talk about, what could have Sean Payton told Cortland Sutton that would have changed his behavior as such? He wasn't going to chew him out. Sean's no. not going to do that in this situation. What he did was love him up. What he did is say, dude, ask Michael Thomas. Ask Marcus. I was going to say, love him up and put on some film. Yep. Yep. Say, see this? That's you. You know, Sean Payton loves to talk about the vision. This is my vision for you. Yes, yes. And it's Marcus Colston highlights. It's Mike, uh, Michael like, Thomas highlights. These are big guys. Mm-hmm. Hey, Sean Payton, he likes his receivers big. 
Mm-hmm. Not all of them. He likes to have some smaller guys moving around, but you know, it's a, it's a mix. But he always likes to have a couple of big guys, long, yep. you know, a, bo- a body that can that, that can that can win in tight windows. You know what else he could have told him? He could have told him, "I need you to teach Vele. I need you for the young guys. Yeah. I need. We got a lot of talent. Court, we need you, man. You know, we, we'll take care of business on the field. We'll take care of business off the field." Well, it's interesting because and not not just Vele, but Troy Franklin, because yep. Troy Franklin, he's slight of build. You know about at you know about depending on which uh, roster that you, you consult in terms of uh, the way one you believe. <laughs> yeah. Is he in the one seventies? Is he in the one eighties? You'd like him to be one eight in the one eighties, but yeah, he's, he, he's, a, he's got a slight build, but he's long. Devon Vale has got the length and the body. Troy Franklin's got the length. Both of those guys can learn something from Cortland Sutton. They can learn an awful lot. Yep. And it's wild to think Cortland Sutton's in year seven, man. He and Tim Patrick are these elder statesmen in the group. Right. Time goes fast. It yeah. does. Yeah, we've been doing this a while. Look at, um, yeah, look at the look at the gray right here, man. I just used some Maybelline. Cover it up. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, what's nice is the future of Marvin Mims. Now, Mims did talk about last year and that learning and that growth. Here's what yeah. the young receiver had to say. Night and day. I mean, coming in here, I mean, I had the hamstring injury uh, when I got here, so sat out a lot. And then, you know, right now, I mean, I'm healthy, felt the best I've felt in a while. And also just knowing the coaches, knowing what they're expecting, um, knowing the routes, all that stuff, and being with the same guys. I mean, it's pretty cool. Healthy, making plays. Every time we we go out there, Cease, he's got a big play. Yeah, him and Lucas Kroll. <laughs> yeah. Making some gorgeous over-the-shoulder catches downfield. Getting yards after the catch. I mean, there's some wide receiver one potential with him. But the part of the equation, it looks like it's still going to be special teams, especially because the Broncos are looking at this new kickoff play as a chance to flip the field, rack up some explosive plays, another opportunity, and you want to give a playmaker a chance to, to actually make plays. So I even if even if we're talking about Marvin Mims being a starting wide receiver for this team season, I don't think we're talking about him not being on teams anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. That's still going to be there. And it's part of it's. It's part of the package, right? Mm-hmm. Marvin Mims Jr., a playmaker, and that's the way to view him. Maybe not just as a receiver, but as a playmaker. How do you put him in a position to make plays? Weapon. Offensive weapon. weapon mm-hmm. Special teams weapon. Yes. And maybe that means you take a few more, a few snaps off his plate on offense and you give them to him on special teams. You know, Maybe instead of playing 80% of the receiver snaps, he's playing 70%, which is fine because you know what? That would be an upgrade. I mean – we barely played last year. That's the like <laughs> the got thing on the that, field. They're like, nah, little Jordan Humphrey, you're in. The thing that gets me is that like we've heard Sean Payton talk about how he had to get Marvin Mims out there more. Who's responsible for that, dude? You the season finale against the Raiders, he ranked fifth in wide receiver snaps on the Broncos. No, that that shouldn't be. You can't do that. Mm. Got to use him more. Yeah, I, I don't think we'll see that this year. Well, and Mims will. He'll be the one that sets that tone. The mm-hmm. way he's conducted himself this off season, this healthy off season, they can't deny him. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, yeah. they cannot deny him. He is undeniable. When he keeps making plays like that. You know, the ball don't ball don't lie. Right. Right. It's a, it, and he's got to be in the mix. Josh Reynolds has got to be in the mix. Josh Reynolds, I thought, a very, very good offseason. I'm not saying it completely changed my mind because I'm still worried about the drops in in a game. Yeah. But he, you know, 
I've come around on Josh Reynolds, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't like the move, regardless, third wave, fifth wave, whatever. Like, I just didn't like the move, period. Um, And some of it was based on the talent you already have. But when you have that veteran there, and they did this with Levi Wallace. They did this with Mm -hmm. Sam Mustafer. So we've got other positions where, like, let's just go get a really good veteran that's at a good price, and it'll just settle the room. Regardless of whatever happens, young guys step up. Young guys aren't ready. Sutton's there. Sutton's not there. Like, Reynolds provides that steady presence. And not only that, Mace, he was also a playmaker out there mm-hmm. during mini camp and OTAs. $4.245 million of fully guaranteed money, two years, $9 million on his contract. And effectively, it's a one-year deal because if it doesn't work out this year, you can save four and a half million with only one million of dead money in 2025. Right. But this is one of those moves where it's like it's relatively low cost, and you see, okay, if you can fix the dropsies, you've got a good, solid chain-moving player here. Yep. It made sense. Like I. I I didn't have a problem with the signing that you, you had a problem with the signing. I didn't because the cost was, Oh gosh. Okay. You know, and again, you were boxed in cap wise because of $53 million of dead money. You had to make some choices here. You had alluded to this a few shows ago. You had to make the choice to move on from Luke boy, Cushenberry. You're also making the choices to plan for Pat Sertan and Quinn Miners, And that means, okay, how do we find somebody to come in, make me feel a little bit more assured about the room and the depth in it at a reasonable price? And that's Josh Reynolds. And they wouldn't have done that without a Dan Campbell stamp of approval. Even yeah. though the Lions did not want to bring him back, you know that phone call happened. Oh, 100%. Yeah. You know, Peyton's really good at using his network. And, you know, obviously like the report that he got back on him and Reynolds has been engaged and like we like we saw in the workouts that the three OTAs and two mini camps catching everything. Another guy catching everything, Tim Patrick. Yes. I was not feeling good about his prospects before mini camp because it's great seeing him out there, but you could see a hitch when he went long distances straight line. You could see a hitch. And so, okay, if that part of the game is gone, what's left? What we saw in minicamp was the route running and the cuts were sharp. He got his short area quickness back after the ACL and the Achilles to where the equation for Tim Patrick in terms of what's he doing in, say, average yards per reception. It may look like late career Larry Fitzgerald, like about 9.6 yards a catch, right? You know, if, if you've got below double digits in yards per catch as a wide receiver, usually that's not a good sign. But if you're used in a specific type of role, which is, okay, make that, make that cut, use that head bob, to make when you make that cut and get that little bit of separation and it's rhythm timing, let's keep the line moving. Tim Patrick, I think, could be really effective in that. He may not have his getaway speed anymore, but that was never a strength that he had. So he didn't have the spare. So he, he, it may get away for Tim Patrick, may be occasionally a 20 yard catch and run. Sure. It's, I don't think it's going to, it's, I don't think it's going to look like little Jordan Humphrey. You know, taking a, a ball that kind of bounces around and going to the house. I, I don't think it looks like Tim Pat that way for Tim Patrick anymore, but it doesn't mean he can't help. Yes. And in fact, I don't mean to be stuck on this, Mace, but part of the film that Sean Payton could have showed Cortland Sutton is Tim. Mm-hmm. He could have showed him Tim stuff because Minicamp changed Tim's outlook because of the way that they used him. At OTAs, mm-hmm. we saw him. And we said on one of our first OTA shows, like, he's making the cuts. It's just yeah. when he goes after the cut, there's not much there. I know. Then you see it on field in game situations and team drills. And you're like, oh, now I get it. I can see how that would work. Yeah. It was, it was reassuring mm-hmm. to see. Yes. But the thing is, can we put Tim Patrick and Sharpie on the roster today? 
can I keep him as a coach? <laughs> like, can we, does and that mean this, practice squad? Because I, if you put his ass on the practice squad, I would do that in a heartbeat. Because this is the thing here, and this is where the receiver competition gets interesting. We've touched on Troy Franklin and Devon Vele as rookies. Franklin's going to be on the roster. Vele, you can't put in Sharpie just yet. He's a seventh-round pick, so you may be able to slip him through the practice squad. Right. But, oh, wait, you've got... Brandon Johnson, you got Lil Jordan Humphrey. Humphrey, who has a huge special teams role. Jalen Virgil coming back from the knee injury and uh, looking like he's got his speed back. It's could be a returner as well. Returner. Yeah. Option. This is, it's a room that's got quality and it's got names that you know kind of going down the, down the list here. Mm hmm. There's, you know, just 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 do the counting game. Cortland Sutton, Marvin Mims Jr., Josh Reynolds, Tim Patrick, Devon Vele, Troy Franklin, Brandon Johnson, Jalen Virgil, Lil Jordan Humphrey. Nine guys. Nine times. Right. And then you got to mention David Sills, who's another special teams guy. There's 10. Michael Bandy. Michael Bandy and Philip Dorsey. Yeah. 12, right? Okay. Day, day, and again, special teams being more important because as we talked about on that special teams show a little while ago, you're going from 11 or 12 special teams plays a game to 19. Right. In terms of plays where the return factors in and it matters. So you may be looking at a receiver room, Cease, where – they keep six, but it's not necessarily the six best wide receivers. Your last one, your last two, maybe guys who factor on special teams. You have to consider that as well as part of what makes this dynamic so complex. Last year, they didn't have enough good receivers kind of going, you know, going in. Part of it was you looked around, Tim Patrick was injured, Galen Virgil was injured. Now, with everybody healthy, you've got a good problem. But you've got a problem here. Mm -hmm. You're going to cut some quality. You're going to cut. You're going to cut some names that people know. Unless again, you lose like if if there's another wave of injuries and you lose two or three guys, then it sorts itself out naturally. But right now, sitting here today, assuming some better luck health wise at wide receiver, there are going to be some painful cuts coming at this position. Another thing that's going to cramp you is the running backs. Because you're probably going to keep more backs, mm -hmm. which means you're going to keep less wide receivers. What if you keep four backs? I Not even counting Michael Burton and fullback. Right, right. I don't ever count Burton, but I'm like, I, I think you might, might already be doing that. You know, you're keeping Troutman, you're keeping Dulcich, uh, you're keeping Nate Adkins, uh, uh, you're keeping Kroll. You might not keep Dulcich, by the way. So yeah, like, don't, of the, those the names cunt. you mentioned, like if I'm thinking, I go. Uh, if if I were to go lighter, there would probably be Dulcich choose the odd yep. person out there. Yep. Yep. I'd rather keep Lil Jordan Humphrey than Greg Dulcich. Lil Jordan Humphrey is a plus player on special teams. Yep. That's a huge part of it for him. This is going to be massive. As someone who regularly ignores special teams, this year is completely different. Oh. <laughs> I have heard the choir of angels sing. <laughs> Cecil has special teams religion. Yes, yes. Thank yes, you. Yes. I'm, I'm sick just... of apologizing for my attention to that phase. <laughs> hey, you got you've got a notebook full of like hang times from the Shrine game in Orlando in 2010. So <laughs> somewhere around here, yes, I do. Somebody likes it a little bit more than somebody else, but just do the math, yeah. man. Do the math. Yeah. This wide receiver position is going to be tough yeah. to figure out. It is. It is. To the point where today, who's Sharpie? And this factors in the potential of, if things, if the stalemate persists and Cortland Sutton decides I'm not going to show up and you end up trading him today for Sharpie, I've got only two names, Troy and Marvin. Yep. That's it. That's it. 
I don't have anyone else sharpied on the roster right now. Crazy. And it's not because you don't have enough good guys. It's you've got too many. Mm-hmm. And oh, by the way, this core, and maybe, yeah, okay, it doesn't have a Justin Jefferson at the top of the group, okay? It's sort of like your edge rusher group. We t- The illusion the, I always make is that the edge rusher group, it's like a pitching staff where you don't have a clear ace number one starter, but like your third starter is as good as your as a second starter. Your fourth starter is as good as a third starter. So like you're stronger deeper on the back end with your depth than you are maybe number up top. I feel the same way about the wide receiver position. You know, if Cortland Sutton, he can be a wide receiver one, but based on what we've seen, probably on the lower end of wide receiver ones league wide. But you get down to like wide receiver four could be a two or three on a lot of teams. Five could be, you know, could be a three on a lot of teams. You start putting it all together and there's some quality. And that's why I'm looking at the, at this group and saying, man, at the deadline, unless you have some injuries to clear, th- clear things out, you're going to have to make some painful moves. Yep. I, Hey, you know what? And it's funny, like, cause you'll hear people talking about how this roster is in dire shape. I don't think it is. I think this, I think by the end of the season, people are going to be saying this roster is a lot better than it appeared to be. Prediction pain. Yeah. We go uh, Rocky three. I think that's Rocky three, right? Anyway. Yeah. That's that. uh, Clubber Lang. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Prediction pain. That's it. That's going to be painful decisions, but you have an easy decision Mace to help us out on YouTube. How do they do that? Like comment, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you never, never miss a vid. vid. That's right. He's Andrew Mason. Follow him on all the socials at Mace Denver. I'm at C. Salami saying OBT's BFD. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned and stay frosty. We got to talk about the horses because you want to talk about athletes that perform. I remember getting an argument on sports radio one time about a guy who's like, horses aren't athletes. I'm like, you're, uh-huh. you you got to be out of your mind if you think uh-huh. that. So you have the world's best trained horses, the world's best cowboys, the world's best stock. Like this is a combination where it all comes together to make a great event. It does. So Stay Smith Pro Rodeo, our stock contractor, 11 time contractor of the year brings in the best horses and best bulls they have. And these horses, you know, they're, they're, they are born to buck. I mean, you hear that a lot, but they are. These are jobs to these animals. They know what they're doing. You know, they're bred for this. And, they compete. Uh, they they, they do, like they bucking do. you off. They do. I mm-hmm. mean, you can see them. You can see them in the back alleys, and they're calm and just kind of relaxed. And when they get loaded, you can see them. They start to get amped up, worked up. They know what's coming, and they're ready to go. And you'll see them. You know, you'll see them guys get bucked off sometimes. You'll see those horses, those bulls kind of take a, a victory lap with their head held high because they know what they did. And, you know, they're right. proud of the job they do. 